Okay, well, hello and <laughs> welcome to our June DVF book club. Today, I am beyond honored to introduce you to Lisa Tadeo, the author of Three Women. Thank you so much for speaking with me. It's, this book has impacted me so much and I'm so excited to dissect it. So let's just get right into it. Let's begin with how you came to write it. You spent nearly a decade traveling across the country, interviewing women and men, even in the beginning, to eventually find your three women. What stood out to you to choose three, these three particular women? What made you choose their story? And how did you get them to open up and be so raw and honest with you? Oh, well, um, you know, it wasn't so much that I chose them, frankly, as they chose me, in a sense. And what I mean by that is that, you know, when you go around asking people about their sort of um, sexual desires and anything that has to do with love and sex is incredibly, you know, just makes people clam up um, or, or tell lie, not lies, but kind of, you know, exaggerations, which is what I found a lot of the men doing. Um, these three women, and I, they're women, but they're general, th these three human beings are the three people who gave me the most, um, the most insight into their lives. They gave me the most access to them. Um, the first draft of the book had about 25 people in it and we just kept narrowing it down and whittling it because you just kind of wanted to get to the next Maggie, Lena or Sloan section because they were the three that had given me the most. So that's really how it, it, it kind of was a self-selection thing. So the whole book is about desire. How would you define desire? <laughs> you know, I think we all, every single one of us has desire, um, whether it's for, you know, um, it's for, for their sexual desire, there's monetary desire, there's desire for, you know, better social standing or he better health. Um, when you're in the throes of desire, and I studied for the most part sexual desire at Kinsey and then with the women that I, I spoke to and, and the men also, you get to a point where you start to realize that everybody wants something and it is the act of wanting that unites us all. And when we start to understand that, and some of us just want different things because we already have things that other people don't have, so we don't want those things. But when you feel united in the wanting, I think it's when you can have the most um, empathy for other people. So I think that for me, desire leads to empathy when we can understand it. That's, that's actually an interesting way to connect empathy with desire. Cause I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't see that connection, especially when we're talking about, you know, like female sexual desire. You know, I was kind of thinking a lot about like the difference between male desire and female desire and how different they are and why society has such a hard time, you know, we're so difficult and uncomfortable talking about female sexual desire and bodies and sexuality. Why do you think that still is the case today? Why do you think there is such a difference and such a separation? I think that for years, you know, women have been, um, women's desires have been squelched and not only squelched, but made to be not only less important than male desire, but kind of uh, irrelevant in the face of it. And, and if the male, the male, the females are the object of male desires, our patriarchal yeah. sort of hangover. Um, so for so many years, women have not, have not even, like I was just driving um, into the city before I, I got here and there was a, a bus driver trying to pass me like um, when I was trying to get into a lane and I was just like, both of our windows were open. So I was just like, no, like really sort of aggressively. And when he was like trying to like come in and he just stopped, you know, and my husband who was sitting next to me was like, I feel like it's so hard for us to just do that for women specifically, but anybody to just say no, like really sort of aggressively or even yes, like, yes, this is what I want because and, and the reason that is, is because people have been keeping us down for centuries so that it's easier for them. It's like, you can't, it's the same thing that's behind racism in my mind. You can't exist up here unless there are people down here. And I think that that is the biggest thing that we as women face is that we've always been below um, in voting and rights and everything. So, so whenever we try to like rise up to the same level, there's a 
there's like a, a reflexive, like, no, 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 you can't do that. And so I think that's what it is. And I think recognizing and talking about that is the only way out of it. A hundred percent. I mean, you can see that clearly in, the, in your book, women are constantly punished for their desire and acting on their desire and they're judged by their community when they do so. I mean, women subvert their desire and, and men don't. It, men are always, they always get the acceptance when we get the judgment and we get the punishment. You can see that Lena, Sloan, and Maggie, they all change themselves to match what their partners desire. They, you know, they change themselves to satisfy their partner. What do you think that says about marriage and relationships and the power dynamic between man and woman? You know, you've obviously seen so, you've researched so many relationships, so many women. Do you, did you notice that women constantly are accommodating their male partner's needs and their desires over their own? I think that you know, I was talking about Sloan specifically, uh, who was, you know, the woman in, in, North, in, in the island in the Northeast whose husband liked to watch her have sex with other people in front of him. I think that whenever women do something for men that's in a sexual vein, it is immediately looked upon as a woman um, subjugating herself. But I think we each have different value systems. And some of us, like for me, like I won't vacuum or put clothes away you know, for my husband, no matter what. I'd be more interested in doing something else for him. So I think that, but we put such a, sex is such a sort of commodified thing that I, I don't think, Slo I think Sloan and her husband had a very sort of give and take relationship. And for me, Lena, who's the woman who was running after the, um, the crane operator in Indiana, for me, one of the things I always felt about Lena was that she was going after what she wanted. And just because the man didn't want her back, it's like she was getting her kicks. And she was, it's like, it's like as women, we put this sort of like this quiet thing where it's like, oh, if he doesn't like you and you still like him, then, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. And I'm not saying that's true or not, but I think that we, we imprison each other. We imprison our sisters by making up these sort of rules that we each feel like we need to live within. Yeah. I actually thought she had agency because she was like, in three months, if my husband doesn't exactly. kiss me, I'm going to leave. And she did. So she knew exactly. what she wanted and she did it. And then it's again, the desire, the affair, you know, what, what do you think about like that sexual desire that is sometimes so powerful that, you know, people will give up everything, their family, their livelihood, their morality, their sense of right and wrong. I mean, you studied so many women, so you must've seen that. What, what, what makes it so powerful? You know, how common do you think this type of relationship is? Like, were you shocked? Was it way more than you expected? Was it kind of what you expected? It's way more, and you know what, even after the book has been published, um, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, even after like, the, you know, there's just, even, even after I've stopped talking to people about the book specifically, the amount of, um, you know, uh, of, of extramarital or extra outside of the relationship, the amount of infidelity that I've seen and heard, and then people feel comfortable telling me because I'm like, it's like, oh, if, you, if you're cheating on your husband, go tell Lisa, she'll listen and with open, no judgment. Um, but like, it, it, there's a lot of it. And I think that for women, and this is something Esther Perel talks about a lot, which I think is super interesting. For women, like we, we sort of go our whole lives looking for safety, you know, and then when we find it, um, we are we are not attracted to safety. We are attracted to danger and to excitement and to you know and to some men are are kind of not wired that way. Men are like they might cheat because they want to have, but they're not wired for the 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 excitement of it. It's more about the I just want to have an orgasm right now and I want it to be with that person. Whereas women are like, oh my god, it's for women. It's like it becomes like a cloak and dagger. Like I think we're just more complex. I think we have more fun with our desire. I'm not saying that's morally okay and, and whatnot. I'm just saying that there is something about the way that we desire that I've noticed after talking to so many women that just makes it like when you feel like a sort of CIA operative, it's just, it's sexy. It's like, you know, it just feels like it's just Secret. excitement. Yeah, it's, it's interesting in a, in a life of, you know, folding clothes and doing this, it's like, that's why I always bring up the movie. Have you seen the movie Unfaithful with Diane Lane? No. Oh, you should totally watch. It's one of the best, um, one of the last best erotic thrillers that um, that is out there. But 
Uh, it's just, you'll see what I mean when you see it, but it's that, that idea of doing the same thing every day and then something new comes in and you're like, whoa, you know, like this, I can live again. If it is so common and it's so widespread, why don't you think, why do you, is there so, still such a judgment to it and it's so taboo to talk about and people feel, you know, is that part of the, the joy is the secrecy is like, is the privacy the top, like keeping it hidden? They don't, people don't want to talk about it. Don't, is that what you think? I think that it's, I think part of it is that if it remains hidden, it remains more exciting. Um, yeah. One. And two, I think that there's also shame. Like, let's say, you know, for Lena, for example, um, you know, uh, in the woman in Indiana who had the, the um, extramarital affair with her high school sweetheart, she wanted, um, she wanted to tell people. And when she started telling people, like she told me and I was like super supportive and obviously I wanted to hear about it. I was writing a book and I was, you know, but the judgment she got from the other women in the discussion group, once she told them that she was going to go through with this sort of affair was really kind of irrational in my eyes because it was like none, none of them had known her prior. They weren't her sister. They weren't friends with her husband. And yet they were judging her as though, and it just feels like that shame that we put onto other women for doing things that maybe we wish we were doing um, is something that I think is really, uh, is really toxic. It's, it is really toxic. And it, it made me think a lot about that, especially in your epilogue, when you include the quote from your mom that said, don't let them see you happy, mostly mm -hmm. other women. Why, why do women th feel threatened by other women's happiness, even though if it has nothing to do with them whatsoever? You, you said you learned that as a young age, but have you unlearned it? I mean, how... What, what, what lessons do you have to show others like how you can genuinely be supportive of other people and their happiness? You know, it's so, it's so funny you ask that. I think about it all the time. I think, you know, I think it, it happens to me a lot. It, it continues to happen to me. I think that, um, I think that even as you're telling someone that it's happening, they are like still doing it sometimes. I think that we, biologically, you know, women are, I feel like we are biologically, like while we have the biology to make children and to do all these amazing things with our bodies, we also have this biology that kind of keeps us like, if we, you know, have a sexual relationship with a man, there's something in our bodies that kind of for seven days, if you see that man within those same seven days, you're going to want him again. It's like a, so if you stay away for a week. So I remember when I was younger and single, my friends and I would be like, all right, seven days, just stay away from him for seven days and you don't want to see him again. Um, so, you know, we have that. We also have the biological thing that we stay home and make the babies while men go out and re, you know, um, seed. So it, it, that biological disadvantage it's a biological disadvantage sociologically in my opinion so i think we need to sort of um we need to get ahead of that and part of getting ahead of that is coming together as our gender and not feeling unsafe or insecure by another one but feeling like we'll have each other's backs because we need to do that in order to ascend further in order to get to that sort of you know equal level that we are that we deserve to have I know it's 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 a shame based culture right now that's that's constantly blaming other women and judging other women maybe even to you know put the other woman on a pedestal her, like whoever it is it's there's just this judgmental gauge that I try every single day to you know root for other women be supportive of other women and want that for everyone else the same way but it definitely is something that's I feel like culturally been instilled in us so you know uh -huh. find the man get the man and then and and then, the, yeah, exactly. I know. Exactly. And actually, that kind of reminds me of when Le Lena actually feared being alone so much so, even more than death. Yes. And it's kind of the idea that we've been conditioned our whole life for centuries and centuries that without a man, women are worthless. There's no, like, what significant can you do without a man? And obviously now, culturally, that has no, that has no truth to it. Not that it ever did, but just because, like, financially, of course, at a certain point it did. You know, now, I think 
women are still scared with this idea of being alone, alone without a partner forever. Like, how can I, why does that narrative still exist today? What do you think? Like, obviously interviewing so many different types of women with so many different backgrounds across America. Did you arrive to that same conclusion of loneliness is worse than, almost worse than death? Yeah. And I think, like you said, you said you hit the nail on the head. We've been conditioned and we've been conditioned by storybooks. I mean, I have a seven-year-old daughter and I read her books and I'm like, oh my God, we're like, these are like, there's a lot of great new books out there, but a lot of the old classic fairy tales, that's the, you know, it's, I mean, I was just reading The Princess and the Pea the other day. And the idea that the only way to realize that the girl's a princess is because she can feel a pea through like 27 mattresses. And it's like, oh, great. She's a princess. She's very fragile. That's wonderful. Now you can marry her. Like, these are the these are the things we're still, so I'm like, okay, I'm not reading that book anymore. But those are the things that, you know, I think we're getting, we, we, we are evolving and doing better, but those things still remain. They're still stuck in us. They're still like lodged in our guts. I mean, I still, I still feel like, you know, when I go to other countries with my husband, countries where I know that, you know, there's still, uh, it's still very patriarchal. I can see when they're like looking at him, even if I'm the one who can speak the language, I'm like, don't look at him. I'm talking yeah. your language and he cannot, he can't do anything right now. So look at me, you know, and, and there, I still see that and feel that. And it, it fills me with absolute rage because it's insane to me that that, that, that to look at anyone else and make a prejudgment based on gender, race, color of anything, hair, clothes, is so wild to me that we continue to do that with everything that we know. Um, it's just, maybe it's me who's ignorant. I just don't understand how that's still happening. And I just yeah. want to change it. <laughs> it. I know. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. It, it's crazy, the, the male validation that's so ingrained in all of us, you know, also another image that I thought stood out to me a lot was when Maggie was applying makeup and mm -hmm. she's kind of compares it to preparing for war. And it mm -hmm. stuck with me because makeup is this armor that women use to protect ourselves from judgment from men, you know, to try to get validation, but like this thing that we put on ourselves to, to make us feel better. And like, unfortunately it, it does because we're getting valued so much based on how we look, you know, okay. this physical beauty, like, is there a way to really escape caring about physical beauty? Did you see that with maybe older women that you spoke to or maybe younger women? Like, did you see that there are, there is a point where people can just escape from it and not care anymore That's so about this male validation? That is a great question. Um, and it's tough because that male validation also kind of filters down into the way other women look at each other. Cause we look at them like, you know, I, I say that in the book, like, you know, we look at other women the way um, a man does. We kind of like, that's our gaze too, in a sense, cause we've grown up with it and, and lived with it. Um, the idea of, you know, when I meet older women who kind of are like, men don't look at me anymore, I can stop caring. Um, you know, I see such a, I see such a, um, I, I see such hope in that. It gives me such hope. I, I'm like, sometimes when I'm not, you know, when I'm just like looking like totally sloppy and whatever, and like, I, I, I know that I won't get the same help from a man unless I'm like dressed in a certain way and, and like looking a certain way. And, and, and I think about that, like going out into the world, depending on like where I'm at, I, I, I'm like, oh, like I, I put on mascara the other day when somebody was coming to fix our air conditioner because I was like, I need to get the air conditioner fixed by next week. And I know that if I do this and that is messed up, but I wanted my air conditioner fixed. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, it's messed, <laughs> but it's true. Yeah. yeah. It's true. And it's, and it's, it's, it's like, and I think where it gets, where it gets ugly is when we try to tell ourselves and each other that it's not true to not admit that yeah, exactly. is, is what gets us in trouble. It's like, like I'm admitting that because I feel, because it makes me feel seen when other people admit the same thing. And I'm like, Oh, okay, good. It's not just that I'm like, you know, I don't want my daughter seeing me. I don't want to perpetuate the sort of whatever, but at the same time, it's like, you know, my goal with her and, and in general with, with, with young women is to help them get do and get the things that I 
was able to get without doing the things I did to get them. And so that's my goal. And I'm always looking for ways to sort of do that. And I think the number one thing is to be honest with each other and to not be afraid of each other and to not give each other shame because we need each other to surmount the problem. Yeah. It's true. It's true. I mean, the goal for everyone is happiness for everyone. We want everyone else to be happy. We want our own happiness. And when you went to start the book, to look for three for like to look for the women were you looking for what kind of stories were you looking for because i i feel like i can't remember now if you were looking for stories of like happiness and love and then you end up with like stories of pain and trauma and inequality <laughs> or or if that's kind of what you were going for because yeah um well that's a really good question too these are all great questions by the way um i feel like um you know, I had just lost uh, my parents. Um, so I, I was in a place of, of trauma myself. So I think that I more, um, I was more, I attracted people who were also in that same sort of trauma feeling. They felt safe telling me where they were. What I was looking for was like high passion. And, um, and that was why when I found Lena, her sort of like desperation for this man was so intoxicating to me because it was something I had felt. It was something I knew my friends had felt and she knew it about herself and felt it in such a very trenchant way that I was like, this is like, this woman is like the absolute distillation of human desire in a sense. I mean, as much as she's her own human being, it also was so powerful. So I, I was looking for powerful, passionate stories. And I think I attracted stories that had a little bit of pain to them because i think when you get great passion you're also going to get great pain at some point i mean that's is there a way to have great passion and great desire and end up happy like (laughs) is there no because obviously you read the the book and you have this empathy for these stories and you connect to their stories but then you're longing for this this hope you know can i look for love and find it like can i have a happy marriage can i have a happy sex life can i have a happy love story or you know ultimately when we look for love does it also come with does it also come with pain i think that it doesn't always have to um and but i think that we should be prepared for you know i i think that with love with with living life comes pain yeah with opening yourself up comes pain um and I think that's true of any relationship. And it mean it, even if you have a perfect relationship, one day, I mean, yeah, um, one day, and the next it's not, and it, then the it, next it is, yeah, exactly. And and I and I think what it's about though is having other people. Like I think like one of my biggest things is if my friend of mine goes through a breakup and then she like re, you know, makes up with the the guy or the girl. I think it's our job as friends and humans to not be like, um, you said he was a dude, you know, you said he was a bad guy. You said he was this, like, we have to go with the sort of flow of a human relationship and accept that it comes with its ups and downs and accept and just, and just being there for each other in the middle of ups and downs is really, is really my number one goal as a human. Yeah. For sure. When you were seeing all these kinds of relationships, did, did it, like, what did it, what did you think about monogamy and this, like, kind of stereotypical, you know, husband and wife relationship? Like, did it make you want, I know you mentioned Esther Perel and she talks so much about monogamy. And so do you think that that's going to be the norm, should be the norm, realistic? What do you think about it? Like, um, I think that uh i'm i'm into monogamy only because like when i i'm not in i i don't i can't do the other thing i i personally can't handle that um that's my own sort of thing i i'm 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 not I'm not okay with like, I'm okay with having my friends have lots of friends, but when I have a lover, I I, like, I want that to just be its own thing. That's me. I think that has a lot to do with maybe insecurity, the way I grew up and a bunch of things, but I don't 
think that's the way, I think the way is whatever is comfortable for another person. And I think it's about the other person finding their own comfort and then meeting someone else who is okay with having that comfort. And hopefully those things dovetail for posterity and don't, you know, splinter out, which sometimes they do. Yeah, I was kind of just like looking over my notes and I was thinking like, what, like, you know, why didn't you include a woman with like a perfect happy marriage or happy sex life? And then I was thinking, well, probably those women wouldn't come to you and talk to you and like disclose their secrets to you. And you probably wouldn't want to write about it because it's way less interesting because it, it is the norm. So I kind of just was like thinking about that as well. That's totally true. That being said, I do think that Sloan and Richard um, had slash have a really great marriage and relationship. I think it's just the barren and there's issues in it, which were interesting to write about and think about. Um, but I do, I mean, of the three people, I feel like her story, you know, she, she was, happy, yeah. yeah, I mean, every day her husband was like, don't want anybody but you, you know, and I think that's something that a lot of people would love to have that in a partner. And she had that, you know? Yeah. And she, and she had, you know, and she, knew, and she knew that and she was happy. And I guess it's just like another speed bump. And you have to realize that, you know, there is these ebbs and flows. Yeah. Um, I also kind of wanted to talk about media and sexuality. I know we kind of talked about storybooks a little bit, but I know you mentioned even Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey and how, like, with this, with the characters, or actually people, sorry, not characters, you know, how media shifted their perspective on desire and how do you really think technology and media impacts, a, impacts us all today? And if literature is a way to validate different thoughts, what did you want your book to teach their readers? I do, you know, I think technology is absolutely gutting right now. I think that um, Instagram and, and beyond and all forms of social media for young women specifically, I think it is like an absolute minefield. And I, I hope that my book, I hope it makes us all feel that we're all kind of out there doing the same thing and feeling the same ways. And that, you know, I mean, I don't know what I would have done had I grown up in the age of Instagram when I was already, I remember being 13 and like, you know, having braces and, and acne and just feeling like, and the idea of, it was enough that there were like other girls in my school who had no acne and braces. The idea of being able to see, you know, millions of everyone and their most perfect representative representations of themselves um, on a bad day. I just, I feel like that's, I just feel so sorry um, for the current crop. And, and also, and also I just, you know, it's, we just, we just need to take care of each other. We just need to, that's why I think it really helps when people post their bad days on stuff, you know, especially younger people. It's like, it, it just makes people feel less alone. And I, and that's really, I think the key to survival. Yeah. I, yeah, that's definitely should tr show your full self. Do you have any other advice just for young women starting their life, starting their like lifetime of love and, you know, self-worth and wanting to, you know, be supportive of other women. Do you have any other? It's about, knowing that what you look for, what you might be looking for, what you might think you're looking for in a partner is really something you are looking for in yourself. That, and you should that, have your own best relationship with yourself first. A hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. Here at DBF, we have like this in charge community. So we often talk about like how we can be in charge of our lives, how we can be the, our, our own best friend, how we can be, be the best version of ourselves for others and making that relationship with ourselves the most important one so that we can really control everything else in our life. So I think that's really important. I feel like we're in tune. So being in charge of one's own self is the best mindset that you can have for all other relationships. And that's really the only way that other relationships can be successful and flourish. Um, well, thank you so much. I'm getting a message that we have to wrap up. So I'm really thank appreciative for all your insights for everything. Thank you for writing these books. I know that you have a new book coming up called Ghost Lover. <laughs> and I'm so excited. I don't know if you want to say anything about that to our audience. I don't want to give any spoilers, but it's amazing. So no, I mean, honestly, I think Ghost Lover is, I wrote that for 
the young woman that was myself and all of the young women that I knew when I was single in Manhattan and it was rough. Um, so it's kind of like I've been there, it sucks, but it's also kind of really beautiful sometimes. So that's what the book is for. Well, thank you so much. I can't wait for everyone else to read it. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everything. This is amazing. I'm so glad you're doing this. This is so cool.